Hey folks, it's me, Dr. Mike Isratel for Renaissance Periodization. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's like a carnival. We have clowns, elephants, clowns also. We don't have clowns. I hate clowns. I don't think they belong in modern civilized society, but that's not why we're here. We're here to talk about the best calorie intake for fat loss and how you can determine how many calories you should be eating to get the best possible fat loss results. So here we go. We're really talking about the size of the caloric deficit, right? how many calories you cut out from your normal diet in order to get the best fat loss. And here's the thing. If you create a very small deficit, enough to burn something like half a percent body weight off of your body per week or less. So if you're like 200 pounds, something to lose like a pound per week, which really if you weigh 200 pounds, that's not that much. That's a totally fine way to do things. But that means the total amount of fat loss you have, no matter the goal, is going to take a little bit longer, which is the downside. However, it's much easier day to day and week to week. Because if you have a small deficit, yeah, you need to diet for longer. But at no time during that diet are you like, oh man, this sucks. You could do a 12-week diet, lose only 12 pounds. But at the end of that week 12, you're like, man, I feel pretty good. Someone's like, are you hungry, tired, irritable? And you're like, no, 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 actually not really. The upside is that you never really encounter any problems. The downside is that, well, it's only 12 pounds and other people have lost 18 and you feel sort of like you're missing out. On the other hand, if you create a very large deficit, uh, our definition here at RP of a large deficit is anything above 1% body weight loss per week. So if you weigh 200 pounds, for example, it's losing two pounds or more per week. That's pretty fucking serious. The fat loss obviously occurs much quicker. However, it's harder day to day and week to week. You run into more hunger and fatigue and irritability and all this other stuff, sleep problems. And as long as you can manage those, you can get great results, but managing them becomes tougher and tougher and tougher the more the deficit rises. So our question actually in this video, what we're going to answer is between a very easy cut that gets you not so great results and a hard cut that gets you really good results, if you can survive, how do we find where between these two is the best place for us? short of burnout, of course. Is there an optimum? Turns out there is. That optimum is met. If you can meet three conditions, you are somewhere around that optimum. Here we go. First condition is whatever the deficit is, it still leaves you with enough food that allows you to have a high training energy. As soon as you're eating so little food that your training turns to dog shit, man, that's probably not the ideal deficit for you in most cases, right? You can train hard with plenty of food and enough energy. You can spare all of the muscle, which means you don't lose any muscle, which is awesome. And you have tons of daily energy for calorie burning activity and just getting all your stuff done. So if you can have good enough energy to do all your daily tasks and train really hard, then man, that's a really good thing. Any deficit that is deeper than that will inevitably cause pretty serious problems. It may not be the right deficit for you. Number two. No matter how big you make the deficit, if you start cutting in so deep that your sleep gets disrupted, that is no bueno in a big way. Why? Because sleep is an incredible fat burner, possibly the most powerful fat burner. Study after study shows that if you're not chronically not getting enough sleep, you actually build fat while losing muscle. Fuck all that. But if you get enough sleep, you can burn a shitload of fat while building muscle. It's the opposite. So any deficit that you plan to do that you say, oh man, I'm going to impose this really big deficit. And I'm going to lose a lot of fat. If it starts to fuck with your sleep, that's not happening anymore. To some extent, the worst, the biggest deficit is, the worse it gets, you are trading, you're still losing tissue, but a lot of it starts to be muscle, not as much starts to be fat, and then everything goes to hell. And because your sleep is so critical in maintaining your fatigue levels or keeping them low, as soon as you're chronically undersleeping, your fatigue skyrockets and ruins everything else around you including, but not limited to, point number three, which is hunger. If your hunger is overwhelming, you start to stress out about it. You start to cut down on your daily productivity because instead of typing an email to Janice, you type half the email, then you scroll on Amazon for the kind of chips you're going to buy when your diet is over, and you go back to typing the email to Janice. And you're trying to relax in your downtimes, but instead of flipping through the TV to find cool shit to watch, you're flipping through the... Uh, a food network and just looking at food like this and you realize that you're so frustrated, so hungry and so pissed, you're not even able to relax anymore. It's very difficult to relax when you're hungry. That's for very good evolutionary reason. Your instinctual proclivities to do X, Y, or Z, you know, stab someone with a spear 
or try to get laid or try to take a dump when you have to. It's all controlled by subconscious and unconscious processes to make sure you do the right thing in the absence of culture and still survive. That sort of system also makes sure that when you are hungry, you're not able to relax because if you're hungry and relaxing, you are diminishing in body weight and you eventually die. You have to go out there and scavenge for food or forage for food or kill something to eat it, then when you are hungry, your body's telling you there's not enough food, it's going to make it very difficult to relax, and instead it's going to get you to get up and go do something about the shit. That's called stress, and you don't want that shit. So a deficit that is very high that doesn't cause crazy hunger, of course you're going to be a little hungry, but hunger that starts to really interfere and overwhelm the rest of your life, that is too big of a deficit. It is not the right deficit for you in most cases. So to answer the question of how hard do we go on the deficit, to get the best possible results, the fastest results without all these downsides is literally you go up to as hard as possible as these three points start to give out on you, right? So you can go easier. You can say, I'm going to lose a half a pound per week, never remotely run into any of these three problems. And that's awesome. The downside is that it's going to take a long time. No big deal if you have the time, but sometimes it can be a little demotivational and you want to get it done faster. And remember, the optimum deficit means the one that accomplishes the work the quickest with the fewest downsides. So here, if you take your deficit and push it just to the brink of where all three of these things are still not problems, and if you push it any further, they start to be problems, just to the brink, that's where your ideal deficit is. I'm not giving you a number because it's going to be different for all of you. But if you know this intellectually, if you can say, okay, do I have a lot of training energy? Sweet. Is my sleep still good? Yes, but I tried eating a little less a few days and my sleep sucked. Is my hunger overwhelming? No, but those days that I ate a little bit less, my hunger started to really get to me. I know what I'm eating right now is the furthest I can push it. And for the next several days or weeks, that's as far as I'll push it. Maybe I'll change it later, but for now, that's as far as I push it. It's almost the definition of like, um, like if you're, <laughs> what kind of stupid analogy can I, uh, can I come up with? You stole an alien spaceship and you're running away from aliens. You know you can fly that ship almost as fast as to when it breaks. But if you break it, then you're dead in space. The aliens come and they, Anal probe, they only ever want one thing, the aliens. That's to anal probe you. If you don't want to get anal probe, you push that ship as fast as it can go, but no faster. Same idea here. You push your deficit low enough to go as fast as possible, but that you still have a high amount of training energy and daily activity energy, enough food for that. Your sleep is still fundamentally good, and your hunger isn't overwhelming you. That's how you know you're pushing it as far as you can, but no further. It's going to take some trial and error. So start on the easier end and push your deficit a little aggressively, but when you bump into a problem, bump out of it by increasing the amount of food you're eating. Training for muscle growth is never going to be the same. A little bit of some bonus information. All three of these indicators will tell you how long you can diet for. How the fuck do they tell you how long you can diet for? How how does Does that make any sense? Well, here's what you do. You set a minimum weight loss goal per week. You say, look, at 0.75% per week, I run into these problems of excessive hunger, irritability, sleep problems, and not enough energy. I'm going to set 0.5 as a minimum weight loss per week, well within that 0.75. So like a pound a week if you're 200 pounds. And you say, if I can't lose half a percent per week without hitting these problems, I'm done. So what you do at first is you start at the highest deficit level that these three conditions still check mark for. And as they encroach on you, you know, for four weeks, you might not have any hunger at all, losing at 0.75. After week number five, you start to have hunger. You go to 0.65, not 0.75. You add a couple hundred calories in to make sure the deficit isn't as intense and you keep going. When you stop the diet is when you can no longer check mark all three of those factors as still good. And you reached past your cutoff point for how much weight you wanted to lose. So put another way, if you're starting to get hungry, even at half a percent, and you said half a percent was the most you'd ever go, two weeks in a row, if you're too hungry to kind of sustain it and you need more food, the diet's over at that point. So what you can do is start out with a rational diet setup, go as far as you can, as fast as you can. That's kind of like um, driving your car until a quarter tank of gas and then looking for gas stations. You don't really know when you're going to hit a quarter tank of gas. Like, you know, roughly it's 300 miles, but like there's some hills and there's some turns and there's some bad weather comes down. You get into traffic, you get out of traffic, 
you go 90, you go 70, you go 50 miles an hour. You don't know exactly when, but because you have a rule of as soon as I get to a quarter tank, I got to pull off and get gas. That's your rule. And when that happens, you cut out. So here, instead of saying, okay, it's a quarter tank of gas, our metric is we have to lose half a percent at least per week. And we have to not encounter psychotic energy disruption, not encounter psychotic hunger, and not encounter psychotic sleep problems. If we can checklist all four of those boxes, we're going. If we can't checklist all four of those boxes because we've already raised our calories, what this means is you actually start with a bigger calorie deficit at the beginning and then add a little bit of food as you go to still coast along. But as soon as you have to add food beyond that half a percent per week, we cut out, we run, we stop the diet. And you had a diet, you're looking back on it. Someone said, hey, how'd your diet go? And you can honestly tell them, I dieted as hard as I could for as long as I could until it became unsustainable and then I stopped. Then you go to maintenance, fix all that shit up, reduce all the fatigue, et cetera, and then you can diet again. Well, shit. This works in almost every circumstance and is something to keep in the back of your head theoretically when you're trying to decide how hard should I diet for, how long should I diet for. This is the core theoretical boundary layer set up for that problem. There are a few exceptions to it. First exception is, uh, well, actually, really just one. Something formal that has a certain explicit goal and then you just have to reach the goal, like contest prep. You just have to be like 5% bad on stage. And that means hunger and fatigue and all that stuff is just something you have to deal with, right? Um, I guess the analogy is like, you know, we got to get away from these aliens because they're not going to anal probe us. They're going to fucking kill us. So even if the ship's starting to be real unstable, we got to keep pushing. And even if the ship is running on fumes, we got to keep pushing because if we crash the ship into this jungle alien world, we can all scatter off and the aliens will never find us. And then we make friends with uh, Ewoks. And uh, we learn that we actually don't have a mutually intelligible language with them. There's a misunderstanding. And the Ewoks try to stab you. You kill the Ewok chief. Now you're in charge of all the Ewoks. And the Ewok females start looking at you with those Ewok eyes. <laughs> and you're like, Jesus Christ, you're like a teddy bear. I'm not going to have sex with you. Fuck. Why am I here? I ended weird. Anyway, folks, see you next time.